So this is my third time making a tutorial on how to animate in CSP, namely because I can't get this right and my process keeps refining and I'm not satisfied with my previous tutorials anymore. So for the uninitiated, CSP can handle animation and it's actually really good at it, like it's even being used for professional anime. See Joko reviewers. If you're on the pro version, you're limited to only 24 frames, which is actually more than enough to make a lot of small JGIF animations, though if you want to do longer stuff without having to stitch a lot of it together, you'll need the EX version. However, due to CSP's future plans kind of being questionable at best, I don't know which versions will be available in the future, nor how affordable they'll be considering that they're trying to shuffle everyone over to a predominantly subscription-only model. But all that aside, animating in CSP is actually really easy and really comfortable, I would say, as somebody who's used a lot of animation programs, but it does require some setup. Additionally, because it seems to come up a lot, animating is not easy. Like, I get that I just said that animating in CSP is easy, but that's relatively speaking. But if you are brand new and have never touched CSP before, you are going to be very confused. I can promise you that. You do need to have a basic understanding of like what a layer is and how to navigate the program. I try to be as clear as I can for these tutorials, but I can only do so much. Additionally, the first half of this tutorial, at least, is going to be more focused on how the program works for animating rather than a how to animate specifically video. I've actually done other videos on how to actually, like, think about animation, such as my smooth animation tutorial, but this is more how the program works, more than anything. The less you need to fuss over how the program works, the faster you can learn. At least that's my philosophy. Anyway, there's navigation chapters to skip around if you need, and I will try to answer any questions in the comments. So, start by making a new project file. You can use the animation preset that is included under the new project file, and this will gain some elements preemptively. However, I like to start with just a normal blank canvas because this will allow me to show you what these elements are and how to add them yourself. That way, if you start a sketch or something and decide, hmm, I want to animate this, you can convert that into an animation file without issue. Additionally, the animation project default just kind of has some bells and whistles that I don't really care for, but regardless. On any file where you want to make it an animation file, you need to actually view the timeline. You can access this from Window, Timeline. At the start, it's going to be completely blank. You'll want to create a new timeline by then clicking this button down here. And if you ever need to access an animation command, you can always look up top over by File, Edit, Layer, etc. under Animation to find most of the commands. When you go to make a new timeline, there are several fields that you need to specify. The only two you should care about are frame rate and playback time. Frame rate determines how fast the animation will play. If this is too high, this is going to stress you out because it's going to be a lot of frames you have to draw just to get a little bit of motion. So I'd recommend keeping this at 24 at most. Personally, I like to go even lower, as low as 6 sometimes. There's another reason also to keep it low if you're on the pro version, and that is playback time. This is how many frames are going to be present on your file. You are limited to 24 if you're only on pro, which means that the lower your frame rate is, the longer your animation can be. You might want to find that sweet spot where you can maximize your length without making it too choppy for you. I'm going to go with 12 frames per second and 24 frames total for a total of 2 seconds of animation, which is more than enough for my purposes. The other elements on this field you don't really have to worry about unless you are doing professional work. These are mostly for bookkeeping elements. Now that we have a timeline, some of the elements are now visible and usable. For instance, we can control the length of the animation by moving these blue little bars along the sides. This is the playback range. This is where everything will be rendered out, and you can control this length if you need to do smaller loops or just examine smaller things. The playback buttons will also become available, so you can also do things like loop, play, pause, etc. And then lastly, there is also the playhead, which this determines what element is currently displayed in time. Playhead, I feel, should be the most intuitive thing. So with all these elements combined, your first instinct is probably going to be to shrink down the duration of every single layer element to one single frame and then animate everything frame by frame. Don't. You'll quickly learn that this is very tedious and that the program fights you from doing this every step of the way and it's for a good reason, because it knows better. This is where animation folders come in. Unlike programs such as Flash and Toon Boom, CSP doesn't actually store any layer data on the timeline itself. Animation folders, however, allow the program to reference the layer panel and tell it what cell to display and when, which serves the same end. The big thing with animation folders is that they can only display one element, known as a cell, at a time. You just need to click the New Animation Folder button, which is displayed on the timeline, on the top. By default, cells are single layers. Single raster layers, specifically. 
With an animation folder selected, you will see that the button New Animation Cell is now available to be clicked. And whenever we click this, it'll make a new entry on the timeline as well as a new layer inside the animation folder. This number is actually the layer name specifically. And if you change the layer's name, it'll update on the timeline. Whenever you click the new animation cell button, it'll make additional entries that correspond between the entry on the timeline and the new layer that has just been created inside the animation folder. As the playhead moves over these different entries on the timeline, said layer will become visible and will be the only visible layer out of that folder. And that is how you get the images to change with time, which gives you the illusion of animation. And as a little navigation trick, if you click an entry on the timeline itself, it'll jump to that layer in the layer browser. And likewise, if you click on a layer in the layer browser, it'll jump to that spot on the timeline. This allows you to quickly move around on the timeline and figure out where you need to be. Now you're not limited to raster layers either. The new animation cell button actually will make a copy of the previous layer's type before adding it to the timeline. So this means if the previous layer was a vector layer or a group, it'll actually make a copy of that. However, to first specify that, you have to use the traditional buttons down at the bottom of the layer panel. So say for instance, I make a new vector layer. I now have to actually add this manually to the timeline because it didn't actually add an entry to the timeline itself, even though the layer exists. To add this, I can simply right click anywhere on the timeline and I can specify the cell from there. You will see that when I right click, it makes this menu where there will be a little drop down where I can select the layer that I want. This functionality is also shared by the specify cells button, which is a little bit slower to do it. So just use the right click to be honest. Anyway, right click is gonna be your friend when it comes to managing your timeline. Uh, you will also notice that because this is a vector layer, I'm able to actually select the individual lines that I've drawn which is actually very useful. And uh, I would highly recommend learning how vector layers work, especially for animation, because they managed to really help out a lot for this. So as mentioned, you're not limited to just raster layers for this. Whenever you click the new animation cell, as mentioned, it will copy the previous type of cell and make a new entry and a new cell. This works for raster layers, vector layers, file objects, and group folders. That last one in particular is probably one thing that you're going to find very useful. You might be originally looking at this and think like, well, this is cool, but I don't want to do just line art. I want to do animations in color. Well, groups are one way to accomplish that. Groups specifically can have multiple elements inside them in a single cell. That said, you probably don't want to get too ahead of yourself and do a whole complete image once per frame and then move on to the next frame. I'll dive into that a little bit more in the tips and tricks section later in this video, but try to focus just on the line art first and then move up. All said, groups are very important and are very useful, but they're not the only way to handle color either. You can also handle color by making separate animation folders. This is how I used to do it, and I still oftentimes will do this depending on what I need, how complicated it is, etc. Here is an example of just a quick crappy ball bounce animation that I'm going to just do for demonstration purposes. I'm going to make two animation folders. One is for lines, one is for colors. For the lines, I'm going to set it up so it only uses vector layers. And uh, one other thing to also note really quick is when you are animating, if you need to see the previous or the upcoming frames or cells, uh, I would recommend turning on onion skin using this button down here. But anyway, when I have the line art completely done, now I can set the entire folder to reference mode. This allows me to rapidly go through and fill in all the colors inside the color animation folder without having to adjust my reference layer every single time. It's super fast and super useful. Probably my most common way of doing this nowadays is to use groups for the color layers and then a separate animation folder just for the line art. And if you don't know how to use reference layers or vector layers, I've made another tutorial on that. It's pretty short. I'd recommend going to give it a watch because they are one of CSP's most powerful tools. And if you're not using them, what are you doing? There's actually nothing stopping you from having as many animation folders in a project as you want, and I highly recommend using multiple animation folders to simplify and separate out your work, because it's easier sometimes to work in parts than it is to work in the whole. And this even has practical purposes for elements outside of animation. So, some of the more creative among you might have figured out that, hey, there's another way that you can use animation folders, and it's not for animation at all. If you're an artist who has ever done variants of a piece, you can use animation folders to make exporting and rendering and pretty much everything much faster and much easier. Here's a fairly old piece of mine that I did, where I was just doing a bunch of outfit experimentation for one of my characters. 
and you can see that I have several animation folders set up. I specifically have some for the hair and some for the outfits over here. And you can see that line art, color, and this was back before I was using groups for these. So I could have even simplified this further by using groups, but either way, you can see that this is basically all I have for the base drawing. When I enable things, as you can see, as I cycle through, different animation folders will display different elements that all mix together to make unique outfits. And then when I'm all done, I can go up to File, Export Animation, Image Sequence, and export all of these at once with a single click, instead of having to save every single individual file. That's just another way to use program. It's not the intended purpose, but it's very useful regardless. There's another tool that CSP has available, and if you've ever asked yourself, well, I've drawn out this thing, and I want to just move it around, I don't actually want to have to redraw it every single time, that is where keyframes can come in. Keyframes allow you to animate the numeric values that are associated with a layer or object, and they can be applied to any group, individual layer, or an entire animation folder if you want to have a nested animation playing out as it moves around. To enable keyframes on a item, you simply need to click the Enable Keyframes button over on the timeline. This will also make the New Keyframe button available, where you can specify what type of keyframe you want. There are three kinds that are available in CSP. Hold Interpolation, which is the most commonly used, where it will just change its position and update its values. Linear Interpolation, where it will gradually interpolate from point A to point B and smooth interpolation, where it will interpolate between the two and also add a bit of easing. Additionally, if you ever use the object tool to move things around and to position things where you want, it'll automatically create a new keyframe at the current playhead. Furthermore, you can actually control the easing by going to the graph editor in the top left corner of the timeline. In general, this is very useful if you have an item on your animation that doesn't need to change visually, but does need to move around. It's also incredibly useful if you want to have some kind of motion applying to an animation that is playing out frame by frame, such as imagine you have a walk cycle and you want the character to move from left to right. You might draw out a walk cycle and then use tweening to make the character move across the screen as the walk cycle plays out. Anyway, I've got some time-lapsed footage here that I think is pretty informative and I'm going to talk over a little bit to just kind of explain my process. I'm going to be doing a simple fighting pose animation. So, once I've got my project set up, I'm going to sketch out roughly what I want for the initial frame. I'm keeping this very loose and I'm not fully fleshing it out because I want to kind of figure out the motion before I do anything else. When it comes to making new frames, after I got the first frame done, I'm going to actually duplicate it and assign it to the timeline because CSP still doesn't have a duplicate frame button for some reason. This will be frame two, but then I'll also add another frame one to the end of the timeline. This will make looping weight easier, as I can use it for onion skinning, even if it isn't in the normal playback range. After duplicating the first frame, since this pose is going to kind of stay mostly consistent, at the very least for the sketch, I can just kind of move parts around and stuff and make small edits to it, rather than having to redraw everything. You won't always be able to do this, and sometimes you'll want to be more detailed with your sketch animation phase, but in this case I can kind of cheat it a little bit and work smarter, not harder. After I get all the poses done, and I'm satisfied with the motion itself, I kind of want to speed it up a little bit, so I'll kind of adjust it on the timeline. Turns out I'll only really need about 12 frames for this entire thing rather than a full 24. Worth noting that I am working at 12 frames per second as well. And I do want to take this moment to state that more frames does not always lead to better animation. Sometimes it just means it's more excessive work for you. Planning things out, I think I'm going to use a bit of keyframing for this, that way I can show how to use keyframes in conjunction with other traditional animation methods. I'm going to make the head and the arms both keyframed items, whereas the body is going to be frame by frame. I'll set up several animation folders for every single part. Ultimately, I didn't actually need to use animation folders for the head or the arms, considering that they only use one cell at the entire time but I wanted to use them just in case I decided to do any transitions and I decided that at a later point. One of the most important tips that I can probably give for animators is to part things out. Notice how I'm doing everything here as separate components. I have the head, the arms, and the body as separate elements. Don't try to do everything all at once. Work in parts. This even comes to, down to when you're doing the line art and like cleanup work. It's a lot easier to just focus on animating just like the arms, 
or just the body or just the head than doing everything at once and doing full complete frames every single time. This also likewise translates to uh, other parts of the work process. Once you have your sketch done, you wouldn't want to do a fully rendered out frame and then a fully rendered out frame, etc. You would want to do all the line arts first and then all of the color and then all of the shading, etc. And also in that vein, anything that moves on its own should probably be its own animation folder or animated element. Think of animation folders themselves as single layers, more than anything, because that's how they're operating in comparison to, say, programs like Flash or Toon Boom. And this is also my third time saying this, but vector layers are really good for animation. Uh, they help out a lot. I would recommend learning how they work. For instance, one thing I can do with vector layers is I've decided that I want to copy her right hand over to her left hand because I really like the pose for the right hand and it would actually work mirrored. Well, I can just select the individual lines and then duplicate them over. And even though I'm rotating them, they don't get distorted at all because they're vectors. When I go to animate out the head and the arms and the like, it's pretty easy to do so since I'm just moving things around and repositioning them. For doing the body, I have to be a little bit more traditional but it's a lot easier to just work on just the body, rather than having to worry about the other parts. Additionally, as mentioned, I'm only really doing four frames for this because it's all that I need. In general, you want to make sure that your frames are deliberate, that you're not doing excessive unnecessary frames that don't really add anything to the process. This is especially true when it comes to doing the sketch work. You want to make sure that every single frame that you're actually drawing for the draft layer is actually important. You don't necessarily need to do secondary motions in the draft phase. Minimize the number of frames that you're drafting, so that way you know which frames are the most important when it comes to the actual animation process. That way you don't wind up making like a secondary motion frame, a keyframe, or a super important frame. Prioritize what is most important for your animation first. This not only will save you time and make life easier for you, it'll also make your animations look less mechanical and artificial. When it comes to doing color, as before, I can set the line art folder to reference mode and then I can rapidly color in everything without too much issue. I do have to make sure that I've sealed up some of my line art here and there, as sometimes it is possible for little gaps to escape. And otherwise, that about finishes this. This was something that I animated in about 36 minutes. Not too long. So, overall, this has not covered everything about animation in CSP, but it's covered a huge majority of it, as well as the most important elements for a brand new animator to the program. As usual, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to ask them below. And, I don't know, maybe subscribe if you like my stuff. I gotta show that, you know. As always, thank you to my supporters for helping me fund these works. Uh, you're all beautiful. And as mentioned, be sure to check out some of my other tutorials if you think they'd be interesting to you or helpful at all. Okay, and that's the end of this video. Bye.